Hello everyone, welcome back for some more video lectures for business ethics. Uh, in today's lecture we're going to be uh, finishing up our treatment of the topic of whistleblowing with Duska and Larmer, kind of continuing the conversation from Davis that we had earlier this week. Um, and again, my apologies about the um, offset rhythm again. Two weeks in a row I'm kind of getting sick of having to apologize and I was very disappointed with myself for making such a stupid mistake last night with the power cable and just my computer didn't have the battery power to be able to handle a two-hour lecture. So um, I'm recording it now and getting it up there. It's not too much of a delay, but I don't like doing that, and um, it cuts down on people's ability to come and participate. I'm just recording this one just to kind of get it done so I can get it to you faster. Um, so again, my apologies on that. Hopefully this week, uh, this coming week, we won't have any weird mix-ups or anything like that. Um, but I'm excited to get into this stuff. I, I really like the whistleblowing discussion. Um, and the three papers that we have, these papers from Davis, Dusk, and Larmer, um, not always because I agree with everything that they say, but I, I like how they are sort of taking this issue and kind of increasing uh, the sensitivity of the kinds of things that could be morally relevant features that are that be important for evaluating um, this type of behavior. And the, and I think it's worth noting that the whistleblowing debate is, you know, it's not quite the this the it's a pretty well-defined type of behavior that we're talking about here with whistleblowing. Uh, it's different from, say, the fiduciary duty debate, where you know the kinds of things that might be morally relevant are just massive. I mean, the number of circumstances that are involved, um, the ways in which issues of, of fiduciary duty could be relevant are very wide-ranging. I mean, it has to do with all of the decisions that, of management. I mean, any possible decision that a manager would have to make you know, would be a part of that discussion. Whistleblowing is a little more constrained, but even within that constrained space, there's a lot of different things to think about. And um, one of the best things about the whistleblowing debate, even for its constrained space, is that sometimes thinking about a more constrained space might reflect on or give you insight into matters that go beyond that. And that's what we're kind of seeing with Duska and Larmer, um, because their main focus is about loyalty. They're focusing a lot on the loyalty question, um, and that comes up with whistleblowing, like we saw from the standard model um, with Davis, that it's the the way in which whistleblowing could be seen as a disloyal act is why it might not be um, the right thing to do or maybe not something that is morally obligatory, that an employee has a certain duty of loyalty to the company that they work for, and that kind of is put into tension with some of these other things that are of moral concern, like when the company is engaged in wrongful practice. Um, so maybe that would outweigh the other duty, but it still means that there's a duty to be outweighed, right, if you're if there's an obligation of loyalty to the company. So um, Duska and Larmer are going to dive into that particular issue. And the way that Duska is going about it is he's not even really considering something like the complicity theory versus the standard theory, the way that Davis was talking about, but he's just kind of like, let's back up a minute. Wh why, why is whistleblowing potentially morally problematic? Oh, because of this loyalty thing? Mm, I don't think that that really should be a barrier. Does, does think that there are some kinds of constraints about when blowing the whistle would be the right thing to do and when it might be obligatory to do it. Um, but he doesn't, he, the thing he's arguing for is that loyalty considerations should not factor into this because companies are not the kinds of things that are properly owed loyalty. Okay, So in that way, um, while we got started with a discussion that has to do about whistleblowing, it can touch on other matters. Um, there, if you kind of just look at Duska versus Larmer, the kind of uh, vision that they're painting, the picture that they're painting about the relationship between an employee and their employer, I mean, they're radically different. And that those visions of like understanding what kind of relationship is going on here would probably be relevant for issues outside of just whistleblowing. I mean, I think it definitely will. I don't think that's too controversial to say. Um, how should an employee think about their relationship with their company? That's also an ethical matter, um, just generally. So I like that. I like how I like um, any philosophical work that's trying to sort of increase our sensitivity to the things that morally matter, to help us become aware of those things and take steps about it. Um, 
In fact, uh, I, I was teaching my on-campus class yesterday, and um, for the on-campus version of business ethics, students have to do live presentations as opposed to these like basically short papers that you're submitting on the discussion boards um, for your discussion projects uh, or for your presentation projects for our online class. And one of my student presenters yesterday was presenting on Davis, and she said that she heard um, that what Davis is doing is really telling us that instead of this sort of human tendency to uh, push off responsibility, like even when it's not a moral matter, people in companies do this, right? They're like, I did my job, and the reason this thing didn't work out right is because these other people, like shifting blame and trying to push off responsibility. She heard Davis saying that the main thing you have to do is to be a good person yourself. Like, So especially when it comes to moral matters, you have to be thinking about my your own sort of personal moral responsibilities the basic responsibility to not be involved in immoral or unethical acts yourself to not be complicit in them but that uh, it's kind of the point she was going for was that recognizing and respecting that basic moral duty means you should be trying to be aware of how your actions or your existence the way that you operate in your job is connected with things that are bigger than you that are outside of you. So for instance, I, I wanted to share this idea because I thought it was really good. And it's kind of in the theme here of like widening um, issues and increasing moral sensitivity. Um, when you uh, take the whistleblower situation as Davis sets it up, I become aware of some wrongdoing happening. Now I didn't choose to do that thing, right? That's maybe my managers or someone else in the company who's making these inappropriate choices or behaviors or something like that. I'm not personally responsible for their wrongdoing. But what Davis is saying is that it's very possible that I can get roped into that. I can get involved and become kind of like an accessory to a crime. Um, but we're just talking about a moral crime, not a legal crime, right? We're talking about um, becoming complicit in wrongdoing, which is not something anyone should be doing un under moral standards, right? So uh, it's easy to, I think, think to push it off and be like, that wasn't me. You know, it's not my problem. It's not fair for me to have to deal with this. And in so doing, ignore how I become personally liable, morally liable, not legally liable, but maybe that too, but also personally morally liable in as much as now I'm involved in it. And even my silence can be a positive action of complicity. And that's a big thing Davis is going for. I thought that the student was perfectly within her rights to kind of extrapolate that from Davis's position. He doesn't quite emphasize that as much, but I think that's absolutely true. Um, the way to do what Davis is asking us to do is to not sort of be looking for excuses or ways in which this is a problem out there and it's not me. I'm not responsible for it. I, I found it personally poignant because in just thinking about business ethics over the years, the pattern I've seen in our modern world is that a lot of uh, wrongdoing, a lot of unethical behavior in businesses are not really the result of individual people. Sometimes that happens for sure. But a lot more of the cases, sort of as I'm kind of looking at this, uh, tend to be cases of a systemic problem where in a corporation, a bunch of people contribute small actions and then that turns into a big bad thing. It wasn't like any individual person intended to harm thousands of people or something like that. But a bunch of small actions were all sort of working together in concert to maybe make some really bad thing occur. And that's something um, that if we're going to prevent those things, um, like even, I mean, I don't think Davis is uh, insensitive to considerations of harm, right? He's not saying that's morally irrelevant. He's just saying that we got to look at this not just in terms of harm, in terms of other moral things too. So he would be sensitive to that. And if we want to prevent wrongdoing um, on a widespread scale, we need to not have this attitude of trying to push off or protect ourselves from seeing, like maybe from our own lights, that we're not involved in this, but rather to be trying to become more and more aware of how we are involved and what contribution we make to those things. Um, that I, I I, so I kind of found that pretty poignant. I wanted to share that with all of you. And that's another example of <clears throat> how something might come up in a very particular moral debate and it might have bigger implications more generally. I think that kind of attitude might be a good way to think about not just your behavior in the business world, but in all aspects of society. 
Um, it's very easy to see these systemic problems as out there, I can't do anything about it. And Davis is like, yeah, that's true, but you can do something about your personal culpability and you gotta be tracking that. And that's, that is the moral life. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you. Um, and, it, and it sort of connects here with, with Dusk and Larmer too. That sometimes more particular issues can have relevance on bigger picture issues too. All right. So, like I mentioned earlier, Duska's main point here is in saying that companies are not the kinds of things that can be appropriately owed loyalty. Um, so, I use this phrase here in my lecture notes. So, there's no even prima facie wrongness with whistleblowing that's coming from loyalty considerations. Again, like I said, I think Duska is open for other, other possible concerns about what might be an inappropriate case of whistleblowing, but certainly not on grounds of uh, some kind of disloyalty. That's what he's m mainly arguing for. Now, I use this phrase prima facie. What does that mean? Well, prima facie is a Latin phrase. Philosophers like to use Latin phrases for technical terms of art, kind of like the legal world does too. Um, and prima facie means kind of like at first blush or um, so the initial appearances of things um, with the sort of idea that maybe further consideration or m further analysis were revealed that that's not the case. Okay, so uh, in this case it might be like because of loyalty considerations, whistleblowing might look bad or wrong. Oh, but then when we think about all the other moral issues at stake, we see, oh yes, this is actually justified. Um, even though Davis was against the standard view, he still had that kind of element as a part of um, his complicity model, his revision to the standard view, still retained that element. And that's what Duska wants to go after. He wants to say, no, this disloyalty thing ain't a thing. It's not something that's, that should be a part of the moral calculus. It shouldn't be something that you have to deal with or you have to have an argument against to justify behavior. The way that Davis was setting it up, right? We only ask for justification for behaviors that are prima facie wrong where there's a possible concern here or the appearance of a concern. I, I sometimes have a little ax to grind about the way that philosophers throw around prima facie. I think in many cases there's another Latin phrase that captures a little more accurately what, what is the concern, and that's the phrase pro tanto, which is another kind of legal term. And what that's kind of saying, I could actually draw it on the board here. Um, prima facie is like, it looks like something, but maybe that's an illusion, right? Maybe further analysis will show that it's that there's nothing there. A pro tanto obligation or a pro tanto moral consideration would be something that's like a real consideration. It has um, it has some like it has some weight to it, right? But after we factor in some of the other variables, like the other things to be morally sensitive to in the situation, we might find that that concern gets outweighed by some bigger concern. And that, that's what it means for something to be pro tanto. The presence of this bigger concern doesn't invalidate the smaller concern, it just means that it gets outweighed. And I think that's probably what, um, what we have in mind here um, with the kind of prima facie wrongness with whistleblowing that comes from disloyalty. It's like, yeah, I've got loyalty to the company, that doesn't go away. Um, but it might be outweighed by other kinds of moral considerations like my obligation to not be complicit in wrongdoing or something like that. You could also take the strict prima facie line here and say that a company that does immoral things no longer deserves your loyalty. Okay, So um, that would be maybe like how the social contract theory is thinking about the legitimacy of a business. It has prima facie legitimacy, but if certain things uh, happen or come to light, then we would understand that the business has lost its legitimacy and an illegitimate social entity doesn't deserve your loyalty, it doesn't deserve your obedience or anything like that. That's exactly how the social contract theory was talking about the legitimacy of a government. If a government's not holding up its end of the social contract bargain, then uh, civil disobedience, right? You, you don't have to obey its laws anymore. You're, you're freed from those obligations, you're no longer subject to them when the government is illegitimate. Maybe same thing with the business. So you could go prima facie, you could go pro tanto, but many times when you see moral philosophers uh, apply to ethicists using this phrase prima facie, keep in mind that they might also mean pro tanto. That's just a real small nitpicky axe grinding thing that I've got is in terms of uh, keeping track of how we're doing our moral reasoning. Those are two really different things. Um, a, an obligation that could be outweighed versus one that might just be an appearance, um, but it, the duty itself might be contingent. Okay, now um, 
let's uh, let's get into kind of the big picture structure of Deska's argument. He's got two things that he has to argue for uh, if he's going to defend this thesis. If he's going to say companies are not proper objects of loyalty, then that argument's going to rely on two key claims. The first one is about what loyalty is. Like, what are the conditions for something? What are the conditions something has to meet to be a proper object of loyalty? And then the second premise or the second core claim to his argument has to be to show that businesses don't meet those conditions. Now, I think when I read Deska and I'm listening to what he has to say and I'm looking at his argument, I think the, the most charitable way to read him is not that all businesses everywhere and all possible businesses could never ever be objects of loyalty. I don't think he's actually claiming that. I think he hit the way that he sets up the conditions for what it takes to be a proper object of loyalty are things that we could imagine a business-like entity meeting. I think that the better way to read this, uh, I think the, the way that's more charitable to Deska, uh, given all the comments that he has in this paper, is that almost all businesses that we actually have don't meet these standards. It would take a pretty special case of a business to now uh, be operating or to have the relationship with the employees set up in such a way that it does it is able to ground um, a proper loyalty relationship between employer and employee. So I think there might be some logical theoretical room for a business to meet Deska's standards, even by Deska's own lights. Uh, I just think he thinks most businesses don't work that way. For, for practical purposes, they do not meet the moral standard here. Okay, um, so that's that's kind of the big picture of how his argument's going to work. So what we're going to do is first talk about loyalty in the abstract, sort of generally, theoretically, and then we'll talk about companies um, and how companies, what they've got going on and why they fail to meet those conditions. The other kind of big picture thing that I want to get into before we get further um, is to kind of note for you how there's a kind of pattern to all the moral reasoning that has been happening now that we've been getting into business ethics, and it's a pattern that will continue. And I think it's a, it's a, I can give a kind of abstract description of a model that I think will help you follow all the arguments that are taking place. And it kind of goes back to some comments I've said in the past about how there's um, that what is moral matters, but also why. It, it, the why question, the what and the why, they both are important here when it comes to um, moral reasoning and moral theorizing. Um, if we take, let, let, I got a call back here. So remember fiduciary duty. Remember Boatwright's paper. He was saying, okay, the stockholder theorist is saying there's a special moral relationship that a manager has to the stockholders, a special fiduciary duty. And Boatwright was like, okay, um, why would that be true? What would ground that duty? What's the moral mechanism that makes it so? Like, what, what's the foundation for that relationship, that moral relationship? And he went through a bunch of different options and then concluded that neither, none of them were satisfactory, right? And he went, goes to all the arguments. And you could agree or disagree about that. But the key thing for that debate is to try to figure out what it does make shareholders so special as the title of vote rights. Uh, paper goes, right? We're going to see a similar thing here with, with Duska, that Duska is wondering, okay, could, uh, could there be a proper relationship of loyalty between employers and employees? Could that happen? Well, all of that depends on what sort of the ground of that relationship. What could hold that up? What could prop that up and justify it? Um, he's not making an argument about whether, uh, I, like I say here, this is a matter of what's appropriate to be loyal to not what one could be loyal to. Like anyone could be could have this loyalty relationship to anything. They could see themselves as as under that kind of relationship. But there's many cases in which we would maybe say that's inappropriate. This wouldn't be the right thing to do. Does that stop anyone from doing it? Well maybe not, but they shouldn't. Right? We might say that they shouldn't. That wouldn't be the right thing to do, morally speaking. So as soon as we're having the discussion about what loyalty relationships would be right to have and which ones would be inappropriate to have, morally speaking, we need to back that claim up. We gotta shoulder our burden of proof and the way we're gonna do that is by appealing to moral realities or more morally relevant features of situations. So you'll see this come up a lot. Our, our next big topic is gonna be affirmative action and you're gonna see Hedinger and Pojman, the two philosophers in that debate, um, focusing on 
understanding what could be the underlying why about why affirmative action policies could be seen as just or as unjust. That's going to be the main debate, right? Uh, is there a moral problem uh, or something morally ideal about affirmative action policies in the business world? Um, and there's going to be a big debate about that. And Hedinger and Pojman are two really good philosophers about that because they get into the weeds. They, they get into like what's in the background here? What's holding this all up? Why, would it, why, would, why do people think that that what, that conclusion, makes sense? What moral realities could they appeal to to try to justify that? And that's what we have to dig into. So this isn't going to be the last time you're going to see this pattern. And I, and I think that model is a good one to be tracking. It helps you kind of get into these debates and see what's going on here um, following why they're talking about the things that they're talking about. When I've taught this class before, um, my, my sort of something I've learned from experience is that a lot of students approach moral matters by thinking about conditions. They're thinking about, what if things are like this? What if things are like that? And that's not wrong. Um, philosophers do that. But they're doing that, they're thinking about different conditions, not because they're trying to just get a detailed picture of all the what's, all the behavior, but to make sure that the underlying justifications are consistent, the whys are consistent, that we're not holding double standards, that we're not being hypocrites, things like that. So I, I wanted to put that back on your radar. Okay, but let's get into the details here. So step one of Duska's project is to talk about what are the standards for appropriate loyal re loyalty relationships. And we're even going to take a step back from that and talk about different types of loyalty. And this is where Duska gets into idealism versus this position of social atomism versus this position of being a moderate. Okay, so let's talk about idealism first. This type of loyalty is a devotion to an idea, a cause, a purpose, some abstract entity, not a person. It's actually not going to be a convention. It won't be an institution. It wouldn't be a particular people or set of people, a person or a set of people. It's like the customers. It's not going to be about particular laws. But these things might be vehicles for it. And let me give you a little example of what I mean. So I, I kind of feel a little bit of loyalty to Bellevue College personally. This is a personal example for me. Um, I'm an employee of the college, um, and I'm, I kind of see that loyalty. Uh, I feel loyalty surrounding my employment here. But I don't think that I have any loyalty to Bellevue College, the institution, or its particular rules. But where my feelings of loyalty come from are the mission that Bellevue College has. Um, is definitely the mission I have and that I want to be able to participate with and my employment at Bellevue College allows me to participate with that mission. That mission is to try to give quality education, like high quality education, to uh, students in a way that makes it accessible and available for people who otherwise might not have the opportunity. That is a part, that's an explicit stated part of Bellevue College's mission, um, that it doesn't have to be um, paying a lot of money to some big fancy college to be able to get a quality education, to try to make that more accessible to more people. Um, that is also my mission. I'm very passionate about that. I think that's really important. Um, it sort of reflects in how I teach philosophy too, that I'm like, philosophy is not just for certain people. It's not an elitist sort of thing. I, I, that's why I love teaching business ethics because I don't have philosophy majors in these classes. I love teaching philosophy to people who are not planning on getting into the field uh, or going super deep with it. Um, I think it has something to, of value for everybody. So Bellevue College has that mission. And they, they even have a mission statement about it. There, there's policies and rules on the books about it. But it's not to those policies and rules that I'm loyal. It's to the idea that's behind them. That's where, if I feel any loyalty to the college, that's where it's coming from for me. That would fit under this kind of type of loyalty that is this idealism model. Um, it could also be to something like um, like your religious faith. You could have loyalty to that. It's not to a church. It's not to a particular social institution or a tradition or something like that. But it might be to the ideals, the ideas that are behind it. Someone could be loyalty. Uh, this is another thing. Like We talk about patriotism, right? Loyalty to America. Well, you might have a loyalty to just this side, right? This tribe, this government, these laws. Um, the Constitution, stuff like that. But that wouldn't be idealism. It would be idealism 
if what you're loyal to is the values of the Constitution, right? The ideas behind them, a moral vision, uh, a picture of justice, right? That would be idealism, okay? So that's what I mean by saying these elements might be involved, but the loyalty transcends the vehicles that serve to manifest it, okay? That's how idealism is looking at uh, loyalty. So in the business world, this might look like a conviction and commitment to the idea that's behind the company, okay? That's the thing that you could be loyal to uh, under the idealism type of loyalty. Now, I'm actually going to skip ahead to Duska's attack on this, and then we'll bounce back to looking at the other ones. I mean, Duska thinks that this is, uh, that idealism is basically a whole category of loyalty that should be considered illegitimate. That's a pretty extreme route, and you might disagree with him. I, I kind of disagree with, with um, Duska about this. I share his concerns, and I uh, appreciate his concerns. I, I think there's a response that can be made to them that's short of saying, any loyalty of this form is illegitimate, which is what he's really arguing for. But the main thing that he's worried about is that the value and importance of individual people can get lost in the pursuit of the vision or idea one is loyal to. So this is kind of, I, I've got a bunch of metaphors here in the lecture notes, fetishizing moral rules, treating the rules as ends in themselves when it's like people that should be considered ends in themselves, kind of like Kant was talking about, right? I think Duska's got a little Kantianism going on here. Um, the rules are just the way that we uh, participate in respecting that kind of value. Um, the rules themselves are means. People are ends, right? Um, preserving laws past the point that they actually serve people, like Mill was worried about in utilitarianism. He was like, how would we know when a law has lost its authority? Well, you have to look at how it's affecting people. And you shouldn't hang on to a law just because that's the law. Same thing for a moral rule or a moral vision. Um, sometimes those attempts to understand an idealistic picture of how things ought to be might need to be updated. And how would we tell? Maybe by how it's affecting people, and we shouldn't lose track of that. Um, it could be a distraction, Duska is saying. Uh, replacing the spirit of the law with the letter of the law, that makes a rule as an end in itself. Um, and he definitely talks about religious and political wars and that he thinks a lot of the motivation behind them are ideological. Um, so they're dangerous in that sort of way. Um, he says, the loyalties to these ideals justify the heinous acts we've witnessed in history that are done in the name of abstract causes. I think there's some responses to this, like I mentioned. I, I, don't, I don't think that we need to go this far to respect these concerns. Um, and uh, in certain particular cases, I could definitely get into that. Um, I think there are many examples of this where ditching the idealistic kind of loyalty is also super dangerous. Like if we if we do stop caring about the values that are encoded in the Constitution, for example, like I, I'm not the I'm not at the level of patriotism that would maybe cross the line into nationalism. Like nationalism is much more dangerous, I think. Um, patriotism's got its risks too, but if you're an American patriot in this idealistic sense, then what are you committed to? Well, you're committed to values of equality and freedom for people and that everyone deserves happiness. Those are the kind of core principles of the Constitution. Um, and those values seem pretty important. And if we um, lose our commitment to those kinds of values for the sake of individual people, let's say, that could also be dangerous then we could start sacrificing um, sort of parameters or rules or structures or order of our moral values. They start to get watered down. Um, many times when I've talked with students in the past, they've been concerned about like, like actually this came up in the discussion yesterday. People asked me in the class, would I blow the whistle on a company for the sake of like say Davis's complicity theory if it meant putting my family and myself at risk? Because we were talking about the paradox of burden, right? Whistleblowers are faced with um, a lot of retaliatory stuff and, and they put their own livelihood at risk when they blow the whistle. Davis thought that they needed to do it anyway. It was obligatory if it's to avoid personal moral culpability. And I answered, yeah, yeah, I would do that, even if it put my family at risk. And my students were like, well, what about your duty to your family? And I, my sort of response about this is that I cannot exhaust my duty to my family by violating other rules of justice by using immoral means to do so. Um, 
if I think something like stealing bread to feed my family is ethical, which I kind of do, it's because I think it's morally justified to do it. That that actually isn't an immoral act. Um, I do not think that stealing is one of the most heinous moral crimes that people are capable of. We could have a debate about that if you want to. I might rustle some feathers on that one, um, but we could have a debate about that. Um, but I do think that you cannot fulfill moral duties by violating other moral duties. You can't rob Peter to pay Paul kind of thing. Although I just you said stealing is that. But that's just a metaphor, right? A t an idiomatic turn of phrase. Um, like I said, if you want to have that deeper debate, let me know. I'd be happy to have that conversation with you um, if I can s explain more of what I'm thinking about that. But I, I do think that that's right. Um, so I am a little concerned about how a loss of loyalty to moral ideals, like how idealism is saying, that could undercut um, our ability to respect the people that those moral laws are trying to protect. All right? Those moral ideals might not just be letters of the law sort of thing, but the spirit of them might be to serve people. And if I don't respect those ideals, I might end up not respecting people. So the very reasons that Duska is concerned about idealism motivate me to be concerned about the rejection of idealism wholesale the way that Duska promotes it. But let's just grant that, like, if I was having a conversation, I'd be like, moving on, I'd be happy to grant for the sake of argument, Duska, your point here, okay, idealism is problematic, you say that we should never have loyalty on those grounds. Okay, fine, let's keep going for the sake of argument. I disagree with that, but let's see what else you have to say. Okay, then he talks about social atomism. This is the total opposite position of idealism, where everything about loyalty is just reduced and cashed out in terms of normal bonds of obligations that exist between people. So we might think of loyalty as something that goes above and beyond that. <clears throat> um, it's not Loyalty is not just a matter of the basic moral obligations that I have to like respect your right to life uh, or your right to bodily autonomy or something like this, right? Um, but it might be something extra special. And <clears throat> the social atomist view of loyalty is to say, no, it's not anything different from those things. And you can really reduce it. The reason why it's called social atomism is that you can, I'll do some more drawing here. <clears throat> you can reduce loyalty relationships to, like, let's say um, one person has a relationship of loyalty to another person like this, right? Can you see that? There we go. Okay. Should have drawn it. Actually, let me draw it more over here so I'm in frame a little bit better. Let's put it over here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so <clears throat> if one person is in a bond of loyalty with another person, then it's almost like you can ignore that this person is like present. Not, I mean, not, not strictly speaking, but I can understand this relationship that I'm in with this person just in terms of the moral obligations um, that I have as an individual, okay, so uh, what I must do, um, what I'm duty bound or morally bound to do with respect to this person is a way to understand how I am loyal to them, and that's it. Yeah, this is going to be in contrast with the moderate position, which is going to say you cannot reduce relationships of loyalty to just the obligations of individual actors, okay, so if this is a two-way street, right, like like say um, there's a loyalty relationship between me and my life partner or me and my child or something, then it would be kind of like there's moral obligations on both sides to each other, but those are really reducible to just the individual obligations of each person in that relationship. Okay, so kind of like uh, if we sign a contract together, well then I'm loyal to you in as much as I put myself under this kind of obligation of promise making, by agreeing to fulfill my end of the bargain, and then you have to do your end of the bargain. We take one plus one, we get two. Right? That's it. Moderate moderate position is very different. Okay, um, and I can't actually talk about uh, Duska's problem with social atomism uh, without talking about the moderate position, because because basically Duska's objection to social atomism is saying this reduction is missing out on a whole lot of the moral realities that are present, namely that. When two people get into a loyalty relationship like this, there's actually a new thing that's created. There's a third thing, this thing, the relationship itself, um, that we can talk about that sensibly as a, a thing that involves the individual people, but that's bigger than them. It's like one plus one equals three, 
That's how Deska is thinking about it. Okay, so so let's talk more about this. Um, and I'll give you some examples. I, I like family relationships here. I think that's a really good uh, illustration or frame of reference as an example for what we're talking about. Take a, a committed um, partnership, like a, like a romantic partnership, a life partner kind of thing, whatever form of that you want to imagine. Um, in a life partnership, two people kind of commit to each other. But the... You you know you you talk with your partner maybe you've talked with you, if you have a partner you've talked this way about it or you think this way about it that you're like there's me there's what's happening with me there's what's happening with them and then there's what's happening with us so I could be doing well they could be doing well but we could be doing badly right the relationship could be in trouble um, it could be doing well it could be flourishing or it could be suffering it could be not flourishing even if the individual people are doing fine. And that there's there's something different. Um, there's a different moral space that's created in that shared we, that us, like the story of us kind of thing, right? Um, that's different than just the individual responsibilities I have to my partner and that they have to me. Breaking it down like that, Duska thinks, is doing some violence to the moral realities of relationships. And he's thinking, he, he commits to the moderate position. He thinks that whether a relationship, because relationships could be, they could be this kind of moderate view of relationships, that there's this third thing. Depending on the relationship, it could have the kinds of moral realities that could support a loyalty bond here, or maybe not, right? Maybe not, um, depending on what type of relationship it is. So Duska is going to say, if you want to understand whether something is a proper object of loyalty, you got to look at how are you related with it? What is the status of this this thing? And can it support that? So take, for example, uh, well, maybe this is a little uh, vulgar, um, so fair warning. Um, but it, the, the term is just so nice. It, it's going to set the contrast really well. So you've got like a life partner, right? And the kinds of things that you do with each other, the way that you're related to each other, is uh, very intimate. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability there. And so maybe that's the kind of thing that could involve a loyalty relationship for reasons we'll talk about later. I actually will get to the details of Duska's conditions here for relationships that are proper objects of loyalty. But um, imagine contrasting that with a relationship of, and there's a vulgarity, fuck buddies. Right? That kind of relationship doesn't have all the same binding relations between it, right? There's some, there's some, but maybe that's not enough to see it as uh, a proper foundation for loyalty, right? There, and kind of with like the fuck buddy situation, there's no promises about that, right? It's just sort of like, yeah, hook up every once in a while, but, you know, there's no expectations, there's no commitments, there's no, there's not all that other sort of investment. Maybe some investment, but not on the level of like committed life partners. Um, which one is better? We it's a whole separate discussion about sexual ethics and relationship relationship ethics, but it would probably be fair to say that there isn't like the whole idea of a fuck buddy arrangement is not one that involves loyalty, right? So it can't support that. It's not robust enough of a third thing here. There's not much being created in that space um, to then be the basis for a loyalty relationship. So that's kind of how Dusk is thinking about this stuff. Okay. So. Um, yeah, I mean, the main, if you want to see the main argument here um, for Duska's rejection of social atomism, he thinks it's just missing out on this shared reality, uh, this third thing. And the other big thing that we should say theoretically about how Duska is approaching this is that for Duska, the nature of this third thing is going to be sort of teleological, kind of like Aristotle. The purpose of it, the function of it, is what gives it the reality that it has. So um, how we are bound together, or how he talks later here about the ties that bind, is going to be based on the kind of shared purpose that we have, this cooperative purpose that we are aligned with regard to. Okay, That will define our relationship, Duska thinks. So if we want to look at whether a relationship could be a proper object of loyalty, we got to think about what's the purpose that uh, the relationship um, has which the people are bound together because of their involvement in that. 
Maybe now you can see why Duska calls this position moderate, because it seems like it's borrowing ideas from social atomism and from the idealism thing. I mean, the whole idea of ideal of <clears throat> the form of loyalty that under, under the idealism theory is that it's to an idea that you are loyal, which is like a purpose, right? A project, a goal, a vision, something like this, an ideal. Um, and that is being retained, except that in the moderate position, this is always a shared purpose of the people involved. So it's always about people that you are loyal to. But the nature of that loyalty or the nature of that relationship is this kind of abstract thing that you both participate in. Okay? But it's always got to have the people. That's the part from social atomism that the moderate position is incorporating. I can't have a relationship of me loyal to some abstraction that doesn't have at the other end of it a person. Okay? So you might also call the moderate position a relational theory of loyalty. That it's not just the people, and it's not just the idea, but it's this way in which a relationship, the idea of this metaphysical thing, a relationship, is always a person plus a, an ideal put together. right? And, and so tightly connected that you cannot separate them. Right? That's what a relationship is to Duska. Very interesting as just general philosophical food for thought. I'm curious about your reactions as always about that too. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about that. But that's how Duska is going to approach this. Okay, so what are these ties that bind that are required? I wish Duska had gotten a little more explicit than he does, but we'd have plenty of clues for how he wants to put this together. One thing he particularly picks out is this idea of mutual fulfillment and support. So <clears throat> loyalty to a life partner, family members, that is absolutely on the table. You could be loyal to the family, right, um, that has all these connections of different family members. It doesn't always have to just be one person and another person. It could be a group, like the family together, right, and the, the bonds that they have related together, right? A, a really good example here, again, of how the moderate thing is something different than just obligations to particular people. Think about a family that has more than one person in it, right? Like you've got individual relationships with different family members and those are all kind of different, but then you put the people together in the same room and it's like, well, that's something a little different. And it's a little bit more than the sum of its parts, right? Um, that there is this extra something that is that shared, shared reality of that relationship. Um, I think Duska commits to the idea that that relationship, the purpose that binds people together uh, would have to be something like mutual fulfillment and support in order to be a foundation, a relationship foundation, a relational foundation for appropriate commitments of loyalty. And that's exactly what Duska thinks businesses don't have. They don't have that. The relationship between an employee and their employer is not premised on mutual fulfillment and support. Um, that's not the purpose of the exchange. It's not the purpose of the relationship. Is there a relationship between an employer and an employee? Yes. But they don't have this commitment to mutual fulfillment and support. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, wait a second. There's kind of a major reality going on in this relationship between employer and employee. It's kind of like the employee is helping the company with its purpose of making profit. Right? And to the, the people that you're, are your bosses, you're helping them out. And they're helping you out. They're paying you a paycheck. Isn't that like a win-win scenario? Kind of like, you know, I get together with my life partner and I'm like, I'm committed to you doing good and you're committed to me doing good, right? We're, we're working together cooperatively. Isn't that meeting this condition, Duska? And I think Duska would be like, nope, no, no. That's not the right way to think about it. You can't see the economic transaction of labor for a paycheck as being this kind of relationship of mutual fulfillment and support. And that's what I think he means when he has this quote of, you can't buy loyalty, okay? Um, why? Well, so this is him cashing out mutual and fulfillment and support with more detail. He says, loyalty requires a foundation, of a relational foundation, that would demand or encourage, maybe some ambiguity there, but something like this, unreciprocated self-sacrifice. Win-win self-interested scenarios, like a negotiating uh, situation where we're, we're able to find a win-win doesn't provide that, right? It's not asking for unreciprocated self-sacrifice, where one person 
is willing to do something that doesn't further their own self-interest for the good of someone else. Basically, altruism. Duska is saying loyalty relationships are only appropriate when the relationship is colored with this kind of altruist altruism purpose, not just this rational self-interest kind of thing. Okay, That's really the, the big thing Duska is going for here. If you want to disagree with him, you might disagree with him here. But he has some other things to say for backing up this, that he's carving this up in the right way, that we shouldn't see the uh, relationship of employment as a relationship for mutual fulfillment and support. One big thing that he points out is this here, that business functions on enlightened self-interest so that as soon as it's more favorable for one party to break the connection, they will do so. There is no long-term commitment here. Um, if the employee finds a better job, they'll give their two weeks notice. If a company is like, hmm, we could be doing a lot better if we had not you and someone else we want to hire, then they can fire you. Like, and they will. And that's what happens. So Duska's kind of saying the right vision here for understanding this relationship is that it's really mercenary. Capitalism is mercenary. And most companies work that way. Is it possible for a company to not work that way? Yeah, it is possible. When I've given this lecture in the past, it's sort of come up in conversations with students. We're like, I can imagine a family business where things are different, right? In a family business, if you work for the family business and you are maybe not the most efficient employee and they could do better if they hired someone else and fired you and didn't have you on the payroll, they might not do that. But maybe that has more to do with the fact that it's a family business than that it's a business business. And I think that would be Duska's point. I think he would, could say you could have loyalty to the family business in as much as you have loyalty to your family. Okay? And the business part is just not getting in the way with that. Maybe it's not interfering with that relationship. Could it? Oh, yeah. And, and I don't know if any of you have worked for a family business or had friends or sort of encountered that scenario, but that often happens too, right? Where sometimes the family relationship can get undermined because of this mercenary aspect of how business usually works and how business culture functions in many cases. That can kind of start undermining the family component. And when that happens, now maybe that undercuts the grounds for loyalty as being able to be seen as a part of your employment for that business. Okay, I hope that's making sense. Uh, let me know if you have some questions about that. Um, but but that's what uh, Larmer is going for. And there, there isn't this reciprocity, okay? Now, why, uh, definitely one thing that's true of the business world, as just sort of a fact, is that many companies want to inspire their employees to be loyal to the company. And um, kind of Desco would be like, makes sense that they want to do that, right? Because loyal employee, employees, ones that are willing to make unreciprocated self-sacrifice for the sake of the company, that's going to help maximize profits. Those are going to be better workers. They're even better than slaves. Like willing slaves are better than, than uh, unwilling slaves and better than willing mercenary contractors, right? If you can see, if, if you can get your employees to see themselves as committed to the business being successful, even when that doesn't make sense for them, whew, that's going to be a, a much more competitive business. The business on its end will be able to succeed more. But I think what Duska is trying to really point out in his comments that follow here, he's saying... Man, this is just a kind of um, a uh, codependent relationship. Like we might say a human relationship that worked like this, that's all a one-way street like that, where the other person just sort of takes advantage of the other person's goodwill and their commitment to the well-being of the other, the fulfillment of the other in an unreciprocated, self-sacrificing sort of way. That's kind of illegitimate. That is not an ideal relationship for humans. Why should it be in the business world? Um, Duska says, to believe that there's a bond of loyalty in the business world is a foolish romanticism that sets one up for disappointment and possible harm. I like to describe this as kind of a doormat situation, that companies want to inspire their employees to be basically doormats. Why? Because it benefits them. It doesn't benefit the employee. As soon as it makes sense for the company to um, fire the person, they will. Um, sometimes companies companies recently have done some real shady shit on this stuff too, like firing people right before they're legally required to have more commitment to them or 
um, restricting the amount of hours someone can work during, during a week so that they don't have to pay health insurance or support them through other benefits, um, firing people before their pension, all this kind of stuff. That Those things are evidence of how businesses feel about their employees. And Duska thinks if they're operating that way, then you it is, they are not proper objects of loyalty. It would be wrong for you to, could you see yourself as loyal to them? Sure, but you shouldn't, that that would be morally illegitimate. Um, okay, uh, I think I beat that horse dead enough. Next idea here, Tuska says, well, by denying that there's a bond, oh, oh yeah, I wanted to say this too. So I think it's, it's, it's worth reflecting on this. Like Duska is definitely motivated to make all these arguments because he's trying to resist a kind of culture. And that will come in for a point later on here at the end too. Um, Duska is well aware of, how, of what kind of cultural things are going on with how people make meaning out of the careers and their employment and things like that. And I think what Duska is trying to do is kind of correct some things about our culture. He's like, man, when we see a whistleblower blowing the whistle on their company, we're like, what a moral failure. Right, disloyal employees. People shouldn't be like that. That was mm, mm, not good. But when we see companies just like firing people willy nilly, what do we say? It's just business. It's just business. Duska's saying, why should we let the business off the hook like that? Why this asymmetrical relationship? Just the same way that he didn't like idealism as a source of loyalty, right? Where it's like it shouldn't be about the rules. It should be about the people. Same way he's like. Businesses should work for people, not people working for businesses, right? The only way that a business could maybe be a proper object of loyalty is if the the business had some kind of deeper commitment to the fulfillment and well-being of its employees. If the business was going to take a hit to profits or something or to its success for the sake of promoting the happiness and fulfillment of of its employees, that might be something that you could have as a proper object of loyalty. Right, but businesses might try to show that they're doing that, or make a sh make a show of it to give the appearance of that when they're really not. And there have been a lot of companies that have tried to do this more recently. Um, Google, Amazon, these are companies that sort of come to mind. Like, um, I I don't know everything about what's going on with some of these companies, but I've had students who work for them, and I've had some students who work for Microsoft, and they're like. Yeah, Microsoft, working at Microsoft, the corporate culture there is you're, you're always reminded this is a capitalist kind of world, right? That teams are set off against other teams within the company for like competition purposes and stuff like that. Um, so, there, you know, it's pretty explicit what's going on. But if you work at Amazon or you work at Google, like they're trying to make this show of like the corporations like your family. They're like your village. It supports you. You should see them like a family. And um, some of my students who have worked for them are like, it's kind of spooky. It's almost like being in a cult or something. Um, and that you, uh, you know, you, they, they make all these show of things. And it seems like they're doing some things to try to uh, invest in employees and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's like, no, this is, this is still just straight up capitalism. This is still mercenary. Like they'll still hire and fire and do whatever they need to do. And some of those ways in which they offer these incentives or make it look like they're caring for the employees are just to be able to attract better employees to hire, to promote profits for the company. So Duska is really warning us here. He's like, don't get fooled by all the glitz and glamour, or the image of things. Remember that this is really the, this is the relationship. And, it, and once you look at it, you kind of take off all the varnish, you unvarnish it, um, strip off the outer appearance layers and look at what you've got underneath in the hood, that relationship is not something that can serve as a foundation for a proper loyal, loyalty relationship. That's Duska's main point. I, I like these points he adds here too to kind of complement this. He says, okay, well, if we don't have loyalty to the company, it isn't like that means we don't have any, any duties or responsibilities to the company. We do have responsibilities. We're contracted labor. And that, that kind of employment relationship puts us under certain obligations. Just not those obligations to go above and beyond what you are contracted for. Unreciprocated self-sacrifice. So many companies these days have a culture of demanding that um, or pushing their employees to do that. I've had a lot of personal friends uh, working in the corporate world that have reported that sort of thing, especially in software companies 
um, and media companies, this happens a lot. People are expected to work ridiculous hours, um, overtime hours to get a project done on time or something like that uh, because that's part of the corporate timetable, things, things of that nature. Um, and Deska's saying that's really inappropriate. You've got to fight for your rights. You've got to stand up for yourself and recognize what I am selling is, I love this quote, one sells one's labor but not one's whole self to a company. So if you contract to do a certain job, you're obligated to do that job. You are not obligated to see yourself as in a loyalty relationship to the company where you need to invest in the company to be successful the way you might invest in a family member or a child trying to promote their intrinsic good. That's not the right relationship for a company. Okay, so that that's kind of the main argument. At the very end, um, uh, yeah, and then he says, like, a business is not an end in itself. It's not intrinsically good. It's only instrumentally good. You've got to remember that, too. Okay. Then he has all this stuff at the end about team loyalty. So this is, again, where I was saying it seems like Dusk is trying to fight against a momentum for a certain culture, corporate, a kind of corporate culture, um, and are just our cultural expectations of, of how proper behavior looks in the world of business. Um, he wants to kind of challenge this sports metaphor of team loyalty that many companies try to instill in their employees. Um, and he wants to say that's really dangerous and shouldn't be done. Um, I think this is an interesting thing. I'm not going to dwell on it too much here in the lecture. Um, but it's another um, kind of food for thought kind of moment. Um, Duska wants to say you can have loyalty to a team. Definitely. I don't know how many of you have been involved in some kind of organized sports, been on a team, even if it's just like Little League or something back in the day. I've been on, I've done sports a lot in my life. Um, and if, if you have had those experiences, maybe you've also had experiences where playing on that team, just being a part of that activity, that sort of shared purpose of a team kind of competing in a sport, that it does bind you together with your teammates. I've, I've made friends that way that are very close friends. And the relationship's gotten deeper from just we're on this team together, but that's kind of how it started. I mean, that set the initial foundations for it. Um, and it, there might be room for loyalty there too, but Duska wants to remind us of like, what's the real reality here? And don't apply a metaphor by analogy inappropriately when the thing that you're applying it to just doesn't support it in reality. Uh, he wants to remind us that sports are for fun. The kind of competition that happens in the sports world, um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about professional sports because that's a business, right? That's where the business thing comes in. But think about like an intramural team in your community, like the local rec center kind of thing, or like a school team. Not Again, not something like college football because it gets messy with money. Um, but just think about playing the sport and how working together with your teammates um, to try to pursue this excellence, this sporting excellence, like maybe like a track team. They're just wanting, you know, you're on a relay team, trying to be as good as you can. Um, that mutual commitment you have to each other's success because you're working together, um, that can invoke feelings of loyalty. But that's just a sport. It's just for fun. It's for fulfillment, mutual fulfillment. Um, in the business world, it's not just a game. It's not just uh, let's have some fun together and try to beat that team over there. Um, Duska wants to remind us that people's lives are on the line when this happens. Their livelihood is on the line. On the line. Lose, losing a sports game is like, yeah, might be demoralizing. You're like emotionally, you wanted something different out of that. Um, but losing is a part of playing sports. I play games all the time. I love board games. And win or lose, I enjoy it. And the, the joy of playing games doesn't have to come solely from the joy of winning. But in the, the uh, world of business, when people lose, uh, lives can be destroyed. And kind of the th through line for all this, Dusk has been saying, for what all the, all the other things that we value, we've got to remember at the end of the day, it's people that have value. There's a very, very kind of Kantian line. The buck stops with people. People are intrinsically value, valuable. Everything else is just an instrument for that. Um, so that's Duska. That's Duska. And I do think he leaves open this possibility for uh, the possibility of an ethical business. There, there's some questions about this, especially if not all other businesses are playing the same game, like right, like the system of capitalism could be a problem here, um, potentially. But I, I think it is, I can, if you're asking me personally, I can conceive of some situations in which a business might be a proper object of loyalty under Duska's conditions.
Now, Larmer's going to go different. Larmer's going to challenge Duska on this point um, and, and kind of try to argue that, well, even the existing businesses that we have could be proper objects of loyalty. You don't need to go as far as Duska's conditions to see a business as a proper object of loyalty. So that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to take a little break, and then I'll be back, and uh, we'll finish off this lecture with the Larmer piece. Okay, see you in a bit. All right, I'm back. I actually had to switch rooms, so... This all worked out perfectly anyway. All right, so now we've got Larmer to talk about in this discussion about whistleblowing. And Larmer's, um, again, taking a kind of interesting and novel tack on uh, the standard whistleblowing debate and especially with the issue of loyalty in the mix. Um, Larmer's fighting a two-front war in this paper. On the one hand, he disagrees with people like Duska who think that... Um, uh, business uh, employees don't have any obligation of loyalty to the business. But he also disagrees, on the other hand, with the kind of standard model that sees uh, disloyalty, or the fact that whistleblowing is disloyal, as a prima facie or pro tanto reason for thinking whistleblowing could be inappropriate. Okay, So there's really two movements to Larmer's paper, too, based on how he's trying to respond to two different opponents, kind of one over here and one over here, kind of a two-front war he's fighting. Um, so he says, on the one hand, Dusk is wrong. We have loyalty to the company. But on the other hand, whistleblowing is not a violation of company loyalty. This isn't him kind of, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, for Larmer, He's not contradicting himself. He doesn't have, and he's he's been able he is able to show at least a possible vision here about how those two claims can be compatible, how they're not um, offset against each other. If there's any tension there? Pardon me. So let's pick these up one at a time, and let's start with the arguments he has against Duska. So remember, Duska was saying that in order for uh, something to be a proper object of loyalty, that depends on the relationship and the type of relationship that could be a foundation for that. And Duska thought that one of the elements that would be important here would be some kind of mutual, a commitment to mutual fulfillment and support that would involve some kind of um, uh, unreciproc the possibility or willingness of unreciprocated self-sacrifice. Those were kind of the key ideas here. And the fact that there isn't this reciprocity of loyalty from the company to the employee is a reason why we shouldn't see loyalty of the employee to the company. That was a big part of Duska's case. Larmer wants to argue against that as like a general principle. He says loyalty in general, we're talking again like standards of loyalty, remember the two parts of Duska's argument, on the part about the standard of loyalty, uh, does, uh, Larmer doesn't like Duska's view. He thinks loyalty doesn't need to be reciprocal to be appropriate. So that's what we've got here. And his classic case for this is the loyalty of a parent to a child. A child may not be sort of showing uh, equal or mutual regard for the well-being of the parent, but that doesn't mean the parent can't see themselves appropriately as having a bond of loyalty to their child. Um, Larmer mentions many cases where stuff like this would happen, and we could fairly ask, like, what are those cases? Like, what other examples you want to make an analogy out of here to then apply over into the context of an employer and an employee? Um, but I, I think um, it's worth thinking, especially since Dusk and Larmer are in such a direct debate, and Larmer is able to reply to Dusk, and I think how Duska could reply to Larmer here too. Usually I do this in classes, like some class discussion. We don't have that right now, so I will try to like fill out some of where I think that conversation will go myself. Um, so uh, pardon me for that kind of aspect to this lecture. It's a little more one-sided because it's just me talking into this microphone, but I'll try to pick it up. And I encourage you to kind of think about it for yourself. You might even pause the video uh, and do that. Um, so... Uh, I think Duska has a potential concern here. So he's like, okay, if what you're saying, Larmer, is it can't be a general principle that uh, loyalty needs to be reciprocal to be appropriate, we still have to ask about what is the foundation of the relationship that would justify asymmetrical loyalty. And certainly with a parent and a child, there's some things going on here that would make that extremely rational and understandable. 
The child may not be in a position to do this yet because of their cognitive and rational and emotional development. Um, it actually isn't until like age around, uh, I have this a little bit of my cognitive science background. Um, the, a lot of the research I've seen is saying it isn't until around five, six, and seven years old that children are actually able to kind of cognitively process another being as having a mind like theirs. They can interact with people and talk about behaviors and maybe you, you, uh, use words that are labels for emotional states, but their ability to kind of simulate another mind inside of their mind, that doesn't happen until much later. So they can have relationships with their parents and stuff and talk and converse and things like that. But it still treats uh, other people as kind of like objects in the environment to be manipulated um, rather than to have this kind of um, more robust capacity for empathy or something like that, right? They might get sad when another kid is sad or happy when another kid is happy, but to be able to like understand that or like project imaginatively an inner life into another person, maybe not possible. So then it is fair to say, well, they're just not capable of doing this yet. Um, and that's why the asymmetrical relationship should be that way. But imagine that, that they get older and they're an adult. Maybe even there, loyal, the, 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 there starts to cross a line here where the lack of reciprocal commitment means that having that loyalty might be inappropriate. Uh, it is a general sentiment that I hear people throwing around of like, you need to be loyal to your family no matter if they're assholes or something, right? If they're jerks, that doesn't uh, mean you aren't to be loyal to them or when you have like estranged family members but you still like support them or stick up for them somehow, uh, even if relationships are bad. But like I say, a little little thought for me here, like maybe at a certain point this crosses the line to being a doormat. And I think we have intuitions about that too. I think we definitely have some intuitions about relationships that turn abusive, like a codependent relationship that then starts moving in the abusive direction, that at that point you've lost your loyalty. I was talking about like life partners earlier Life partners are oftentimes the kinds of situations in which domestic abuse occurs. And even if there is some sort of bond of loyalty at one time, once you start throwing abuse into that situation, maybe you don't have loyalty to stick around or try to make it work or something like that. That the, the, lack, the utter lack of regard from the other side uh, is a reason to now see that this is, it would actually be inappropriate for me to see myself as in a loyalty relationship with this person. Now all that stuff's controversial and we can have a debate about it. But I think there is some, maybe some room here for Duska to stick to his guns and have some intuitions to back his case up. I think he has room for argument here. Whether those arguments are ultimately successful or alarmers are, that's something for more debate. Another thing that I, I think is sort of interesting, this is a commentary, I, maybe I should do this, a little commentary I have about Larmer's argument is if he really wants to run this analogy from parents to children to employees and employers, then it's basically like saying like the company is like a child. They can't do any better. And we ha as the employees of the company need to paternalistically serve it. And that starts to sound real weird and counterintuitive, right? If anything, it's like, it's the company that's in the higher power position here that maybe should be more responsible to its employees than the employees are to the company. But I don't know. That's definitely some, I think there's some pushing that could be done there uh, to challenge uh, uh, Larmer's logic here. I think he's got a point here that there's a logical gap, right? That like, okay, maybe strictly speaking, saying that in order for loyalty to be appropriate, it would have to be re uh, reciprocal. Maybe we can find some counterexample cases for that. But then we still have to look at the realities of what's going on in those circumstances. That doesn't mean that there might not also be cases in which a lack of reciprocal loyalty might mean that the asymmetrical loyalty is inappropriate. So there's kind of the other, that would cut the other direction too. Okay. Then he also says that an employee might owe loyalty to fellow employees or to shareholders even if there's no company identity to which one owes loyalty the way that Duska was arguing. Okay, now, Duska doesn't talk about stockholders. And I say here, any ideas why? Does he have grounds to resist this objection? Um, and again, I think Duska does have some things going on here. Um, for one thing, he's rejected social atomism. So he doesn't think that the obligations you have to individual people or something like that is going to be the basis of loyalty relationships. There has to be that common purpose, right? So maybe this is not enough. To say that I've got um, 
uh, obligations to employees or to shareholders maybe doesn't mean that I owe them loyalty. And, there, and we can definitely separate the like the loyalty I might have for a friend who's a coworker at my company versus my uh, seeing that loyalty somehow tr bleeding over into my work I do for the company. And Duska does talk about this a little bit with his discussion of that team building stuff that I was mentioning. Um, that a company might try to leverage my like um, moral intuitions about loyalty to my coworkers that these are people I have relationships with that might be robust enough to be a foundation for loyalty to then have that bleed over into loyalty for the company or for our competitive capitalistic efforts and things like that. And I, and I think Duska has concerns about that. Um, but I, I do say maybe there's more to this that Duska doesn't address or which he too quickly dismisses about the whole team community sort of thing in a business. Um, and also that might be a guide for how a business could be the kind of thing that one could owe loyalty to. So we could ask the question like, like I was mentioning earlier, even if like companies like Google and Amazon or something are trying to, in a kind of phony way, create this sense of community or like a village that you have with people who you work with at these companies, um, is there a way that a company could do it legitimately, not in a phony way? It's a question. Might be something for further debate, maybe something for the journal, this kind of stuff. There's definitely places for this debate to go. Um, <clears throat> also, I think it is worth pointing out, Larmer kind of saddles Duska with a burden of proof to this claim that the loyalty is only appropriate between moral agents. And I, that's a mischaracterization of Duska's position. Remember, he's moderate. He's thinking more about the shared purpose that we could connect about, the third thing between us. Um, and not just uh, the individual obligations to individual people, but this third reality. Uh, it, do, he do, it is true that Duska says that people have to be involved in this, but I think Larmer is um, kind of maybe straw manning or reducing the robust picture that, that Duska is presenting. So I think that's important to be careful about. Um, I think he's, he, like I say here, he's reacting to how much talk Duska is making about how the company is a tool for profit, nothing more. And I think he's, I think he is missing, missing Duska's point here a little bit because Duska is not just making those points and just letting them sit. He's saying those points are evidence about the character of the relationship that's happening, the reality of that relationship between the employer and the employee. Okay, so I think I think Duska is a little more subtle than Larmer's giving him credit for, and that might be relevant for the argument here. Okay, and then there's this other idea here. I, I say this third argument is a little strange, and so what I'm doing here is some charitable reconstruction of what I think Larmer is trying to argue in this last argument. Like, this part of the paper moves a little quickly, but I think Larmer's trying to say this. <clears throat> Even if the primary purpose of a business is profit, and we're going to say that's that's still, like, number one objective, Maybe a business could operate in a way to satisfy Duska's requirements of being a proper object of loyalty if it did things like demonstrate concern for employee welfare by constraining the pursuit of that profit. So in other words, it's kind of like saying, this might be a little bit like the unreciprocated self-sacrifice sort of thing, right? The company could operate in a way in which it would generate all this profit. And what if it, it um, operates in a different way? where it doesn't maximize profit, it still makes profit, but not as much as it could. And that might show some sort of commitment to the value of the employee, a kind of regard for the employee as an end in themselves, where it's not just about the profit. And maybe that would be enough. Maybe that would be enough to legitimate loyalty, to, to legitimate a loyalty relationship. Um, I think Duska is somewhat open to this. Um, and this starts to look like something like stakeholder theory, right? You're exerting social responsibility if you're not uh, if you're using company resources in ways that don't maximize profit, that are like just to help employees and help them have better lives and stuff like that. Maybe that could work. Or like I don't know if I brought this up in the lecture before, but Costco is a very interesting corporate example because Costco could make a lot more profit if they um, didn't sort of keep their prices low artificially. They, they could raise their prices and still be market competitive, but they don't because they have a stated company value about customers. All right? So by not, they're still a profit company, they still make money, but they're not making as much money as they could. Um, you could try to argue that this is their way of making profit, but I think it's 
pretty clear. I, I'm not. I haven't done a intense market analysis of the Costco business model, but on a kind of cursory view of it, it definitely looks like they could be making more profit, and they're not. The way that they run the company uh, doesn't do those things, and who benefits from it? The consumer benefits from it. So that's uh, that would be a kind of social responsibility. It's definitely going outside the profit imperative, and maybe that extra responsibility shows a kind of commitment. You know, how much is going to depend on how much is being devoted to making that happen, of course. Uh, you can't just be a gesture. It has to be something real <clears throat> and something substantial. But maybe there's room for that. Okay, so so much for Duska, according to Larmer. What about the standard view? This is where things get really interesting to me about Larmer's position. This is where I think he's making the bigger philosophical contribution of like a new idea that's being thrown into the mix here. So the standard view, like we've talked about before with Davis and with Duska, claims that whistleblowing is a violation of loyalty to the company. It could be morally justified when it's serious, when the moral stakes are high enough. Then we're like, it's okay to do this disloyal thing. And it, maybe it should be done. Right? But that's still something that has to be overcome, right? When I drew the picture of the Protonto thing, it's a, the duty of loyalty. If you're going to not respect it, there better be a real good reason for it. Okay? So Larmer says, the standard view is sort of painting a picture of moral tragedy. In other words, there's no good option. Um, so you have to pick the lesser of two evils. Disloyalty or intense social harm or complicity in wrongdoing, like Davis says, or whatever it is. Right, and be like, well, it's better to be disloyal. Blow the whistle. Right? Larmer thinks that this is not the right way to target the situation. He does not see a dilemma with whistleblowing. So in that way, he's like Duska. He's like, he doesn't see a moral problem around loyalty. Duska thought so because there wasn't any loyalty to the company. Larmer wants to say, <clears throat> you do have loyalty, but whistleblowing is not a violation of it. It's actually a loyal act to blow the whistle. And how is he going to try to argue for this? Well, he's going to break down the logic behind seeing whistleblowing as disloyal. So here's the assumption he thinks is behind the standard view. To be loyal to someone is to act in a way that accords with what that person believes to be in their best interests. And Larmer thinks that's wrong. That assumption is faulty. Um, this actually connects with an ancient dialogue from Plato. Plato talks about uh, a friend who loans you uh, their hammer. And then uh, they get into a fight with someone. They're really heated and angry. They're just seeing red. And they're like, give me that hammer. Give me my hammer back because I want to go beat this guy over the head with it. Now, that wouldn't be a good action to do. But as the friend, you're, you're just holding it in trust for them, like a fiduciary relationship, right? Should you give them their hammer back? If they're like, look, it's my hammer. I just, bar I just let you borrow it. I can demand it back whenever I want, so you better give it to me. What would the good friend do? Give them the hammer so they can commit this heinous act? Maybe not. That's kind of where Plato goes with it. But he has, he has a big discussion about it. <clears throat> I don't know if Larmer is thinking about Plato directly, but he's thinking along the same lines here, that it would be wrong to see that loyalty means doing what they just want, because it's possible that what they want is not good. So Larmer wants to recast this situation. He, before he gets into that, he says, just as some supporting intuitive evidence here, that many whistleblowers consider themselves loyal employees. They're not just these people who are disgruntled employees. You always hear that phrase around this. Oh, the whistleblower is just a disgruntled employee. They usually see themselves as loyal. Um, let's take a really controversial case. Let's go straight into a controversial case. Um, Edward Snowden is a whistleblower on the United States government. Now, that's not a business, but a lot of the same ethics of whistleblowing would apply here. Um, and uh, Snowden, a lot of people agree and disagree with what Snowden did. Some people see him as a whistleblower hero. Other people see him as a traitor, right? At least for Snowden's part, what he says about himself is that he's not a traitor to the United States. And actually, the, the moral values <clears throat> that prompted him to do this disloyal act are actually coming from the actual values of the United States and the United States Constitution. So he's thinking about what is the legitimate authority of the United States government, and he's trying to follow that rather than just follow the rules of what the government wants. Right? Now, you can agree and disagree with that. Um, but we're, we're wondering about whether to be loyal, to see myself as loyal to someone, does that just mean if I see myself as loyal, I have to do what they say or what they believe to be in their best interests? Maybe not. Maybe in many situations, yes. 
like we definitely think that people have some rights of autonomy here in terms of like their say so about what's good for them should matter like in say uh medical decision uh the rights of the, to make decisions about what happens for medical procedures on you but in maybe some situations that breaks down like we saw in the medical surrogacy example back to the fiduciary duty debate maybe someone's not in a position um, to be able to make an autonomous choice for themselves or they're making kind of the wrong choices is there a way to see yourself as being loyal to a person even if you're not doing what they ask or not doing what they want um, and the thinks yes so he says as an example here <clears throat> I'm not disloyal for refusing to loan money to a friend for a purpose I believe to be disastrous they're, they may be thinking really they, th they think this is a great business opportunity and I'm just like, that's a terrible, that's, and there's no way that's going to work. I'm not going to support that. I'm not being disloyal by refusing them that, that, uh, that loan. Okay, so here's what he wants to put instead. To be loyal to someone means that one acts in accordance with what one has good reason to believe to be in that person's best interest. And you could be wrong about it. Like um, the people who, who don't like what Snowden did, um, if they don't just think he's an outright traitor, they might just say, okay, yeah, well, he thought he was being loyal, and he was being loyal, but he had the wrong idea here. He thought what was in America's best interest was to make this information publicly available about what the United States government was doing with their su surveillance programs, but he was wrong. That it actually, by revealing that information, he damaged United States interests and United States society, right? I think <clears throat> if you took that kind of charitable criticism of Snowden, you're still seeing him as being loyal under Larmer's view. L Snowden believes that this is what is in the country's best interest, but he might be wrong about that. But that still would count as loyalty. Okay, So it's not requiring that you have perfectly objective judgments about this. But it's a matter, it's more of a matter of, like Larmer is saying, this is more a matter of your motive. Right? Loyalty inspires action. What kind of action? Actions that you believe to be in the best interest of the thing that you're loyal to, not action that just goes along with whatever they want. Okay, and then he adds another really crucial assumption here. It's another like premise of his argument, if you will. Immoral actions can never be in a person's best interest. And I think this is a really, really interesting claim. This is a very important claim, and I think a lot of where the disagreement or debate that could happen with Larmer's view might happen here. There's some other places too, but I think this is a major, major one. Especially in the business world, a view that I'm very familiar with is that people sort of believe, you know, what's best for me is to make money or something like this, or my personal happiness, which money enables. Uh, and then morality is like a sideshow. Um, it's just like, well, yeah, but there's these other values too. It's not just a matter of my self-interest, but a matter of what happens to other people or rights and obligations or following laws or things like that. Um, and these things maybe compete with each other. Larmer's saying they don't. Your self-interest can never be promoted through doing immoral actions. Doing immoral actions puts you in a bad state. And this is, uh, I, some of these ideas I brought up with Mill and Kant a little bit, um, especially for Kant. Um, maybe I didn't make this as explicit as I should have. I, I think sometimes when I present Kant, I do get here. I can't remember if I talked about this directly with all of you. But one thing that you can do is sort of to say, you know, when Kant believes that we still have these necessary obligations to, peop to all people, whether they're criminals or not, whether they've done heinously immoral things or not, and one way to maybe back that up with an intuition is that we should see people who are doing immoral things as in a bad spot. Like for Kant, their will is not free, that, and that's not good for people. People should be self-determining. If they're doing immoral things, then they're obviously not free, according to Kant's theory, because they could never freely will to do those things. And so they're like sick. They're morally sick, and they need help. And uh, you can kind of connect with an analogy here of like a doctor who only treats healthy patients. Like it seems like the point of being a doctor is to deal with sick patients. It's just like all the doctor does is like see patients be like, you're looking healthy, don't have to do things, see you in a couple months, bye-bye. Then they're not really doing the kind of work we need them to do. Um, like take triage, right? You want to help the people who can be helped. Um, and I think Larmer is saying, 
what we ought to see is that when people are doing unethical things or immoral things, they're not in a good state and they need to be brought into a good state. If I care for a person, I want what's best for them, I cannot will them to do immoral things because that would put them in a bad state. Okay, so for this reason, um, whistleblowing can be an expression of loyalty. How? Well, because um, I want to, as Lammer's going to say later, I want the object of loyalty to be legitimate. Um, if the business is doing immoral things, it has ceased to be legitimate. And if my loyalty is to the company, it's to the company doing well. And we should understand that not in terms of just is it making profit, but is it morally acceptable. Again, you could see a connection here with social contract theory of like the legitimacy of the business depends on it not violating terms of the social contract, which are really about moral values. Uh, the benefit to people in society and considerations of justice. If those are being violated, the business is illegitimate. If I care about the business doing well, I care about the business being legitimate, maybe whistleblowing is a way that this can help. Okay, For one thing, it can help prevent the company from engaging in future wrongdoing. Uh, the kind of accountability of the pressure or scrutiny that happens from the whistleblowing might be able to help restore the company to a space of moral legitimacy. Um, Okay, and then, uh, and that's why Larmer throws in the usual line about using internal measures first, um, because you're trying, your goal is to transform the company in making it legitimate, morally legitimate, morally good. Um, but, uh, so it's, it's not just like the whistleblower is calling out some wrongdoing and is like, this thing needs to be punished for the sake of justice. It's that maybe punishment and accountability is a way of restoring the thing to a good state. Okay, so that, that's the main, Larmer saying, if whistleblowing is done from that motive, then it can be seen as a loyal act. Does all whistleblowing happen this way? Well, of course not. People have all sorts of motives. Maybe it is possible that you can have someone who's whistleblowing because they're a disgruntled employee or something like that. Those cases I actually think are fairly rare um, in reality. But um, yeah, that's possible. Larmer's not endorsing that. He's not saying that's the right thing to do. But he's saying, look, there's a way in which blowing the whistle can absolutely be a loyal act, in which case there's no conflict here. There's no considerations from loyalty that would tell the person not to blow the whistle. So when I ask here, what's the relevance here to whistleblowing in Larmer's thesis, that's a main one, right? That I don't need to worry about disloyalty as being the reason why I should hesitate on blowing the whistle. If I'm loyal to the company, that's all the more reason I should blow the whistle, right? That that gives a positive motive here. Um, there's some other connections that we can make here too. Um, and it, I think it is good to kind of take it back into the big picture. Um, Larmer, uh, so another big picture idea here is this kind of social contract sort of idea that I think Larmer's got a social contract view in the background for fiduciary duty. Remember I said fiduciary duty was going to like infiltrate into all these other conversations. I do think Larmer's kind of running for, on that platform. That's what's going on in the background here. Uh, his view is an expression of that kind of bigger perspective. Um, <clears throat> that a business entity can have legitimacy to it, but one of the main conditions for it would be that it's not doing immoral things. It's not doing unethical things. Um, so uh, as long as it's legitimate, then it does deserve my loyalty. Maybe, maybe it does deserve some unreciprocated self-sacrifice on my part. Um, but these are the conditions on which it happens. And in that way, Larmer, um, I think, is uh, in conversation with Duska. I think there, it's worth for you to think about for yourself and trying to work all this out and which uh, view you sort of think is correct and which one is not, which arguments are convincing, which ones are not, is to try to compare it in terms of how do Duska and Larmer see the relationship between a, an employee and an employer, between the business and the people that work for it. Um, Larmer does seem to have this kind of I almost want to say paternalistic view of like the employees are like the parents trying to help nurture the company like the child into a good moral status. Parents don't want their children to be evil. They want to help them develop a moral character and when account measures of accountability are needed for that then they might be motivated to do that. Not because they don't care about their kid anymore but out of loyalty to their child. I've, I've seen just as personal anecdotes you know just as examples. Um, I have definitely encountered in my life, tangentially, uh, cases of either parents or children where they're in a family situation where the child did something like immoral and illegal, 
and uh, the parent was in a position to maybe help shield them from the legal consequences of that or the moral consequences of that, and they didn't. And the kid could misunderstand that, and in a couple cases they did. They were like, my parents are not, they don't care about me. They're not loving me. They're cutting me loose. Just because I did this bad thing, now they don't care about me anymore because they basically didn't stop this punishment, this bad thing from affecting me. Um, but in those cases that I'm thinking of, the parents are thinking, no, this is the way that we care for you. It would be not caring to let you off the hook. And I think that's the view that Larmer has. Um, I also, in some of the cases I've known in my life, uh, the child was able to see that. And actually, e even if they didn't like it at the time, they were able to respect that choice and see it as a way in which their parents were caring for them. Again, this might be a case-by-case -case base basis sort of thing, but that's what we, we should think about more is, what are the conditions that are important? What are the morally relevant features here? When is when should we see something as an act of loyalty and when not? And when is that loyalty appropriate and when not? If I'm going to be hired at a business, what should I be thinking about in understanding the relationship that we have and how that informs my involvement with that company? Should I see myself as just being contracted to do this job? Or is this something deeper? Is this a deeper, more meaningful connection? Larmer has that kind of optimism about it. Duska's kind of a realist, or kind of like he's just like, nah, nah, don't be a sucker. Company's just using you. You can use them. That's all there is to this. You shouldn't be looking for the meaning of your life out of your relationship with your employer. Um, you can get meaning out of the own work you do for yourself, you know, just the pride you take in your own work or something like that. But do not become just some this kind of willing slave to your employer to exploit you. Don't be a doormat. And Larmer's like, I can see how a relationship between an employer and an employee could be a deeply meaningful thing. And that there is room to import all of that sort of framework of relationship into that setting. Um, I'm curious to hear what you all will think about this. I'm, I'm excited to read the journals this week and see, see what's going on. But a little shorter lecture, that's all I got to say um, about Dusk and Larmer. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I like these papers. And um, usually we're able to get some good discussion, so that's why it takes longer. But I don't have people to talk to today. Um, but maybe that'll carry on in the discussion board and with the journals. So um, let me know if you just want to chat. Again, no one's calling me to chat. It's just not happening. I'm down with it. I'm available. Maybe you're busy. I'm not going to judge. But uh, I'd love that. That's one of my favorite things about teaching, and I think it's good for students, too. I always love that as a student, being able to just talk with my professors and, and kick some philosophy around and think about life and truth and everything. So um, I'm, I'm here. I'm a willing participant in that. I, I'll keep saying that. In terms of a code word, uh, I should have done that earlier, but I'm happy I didn't forget. Um, what's a code word? Hmm. How about doormat? Doormat's our code word. All right. So until next time, have a good weekend. Again, sorry for the lateness of this video. Um, and if you've got any questions for anything that's going on in this class, let me know. Um, but you'll get a weekend update, too. For next week, I'm going to be talking about the uh, paper projects. We should start thinking about that, what you want to do for your paper, picking a topic, how to attack this whole assignment. Um, my lecture on Monday is going to be devoted entirely for that. So we're going to take a little interlude here from issues in business ethics to talk about how to write philosophy papers, and I've got some guides for that, and that's what's coming up next. And then we'll do affirmative action. So that's what's going on for next week. I'll see you then. Bye.